Uh, my name's Eric. I'm the lead pastor of the Story Church. I want to welcome all of you here in the room at our, the Bethany campus here, our new home, our new HQ. And I also want to welcome everybody over at Timber Grove, our, uh, our Heights family at 8200 Washington Avenue. We love you guys and uh, hope everything's going well over there this morning. That's our cool church over in the Heights, if you haven't been there yet. It's, uh, it's where the cool kids go. And also, I want to say uh, hello to everybody joining us online. So uh, whether you're at home here in Houston for whatever reason or and couldn't make it in person or you're in places like Fredericksburg College Station throughout the state and other places, we're so glad that you're here. Hey, y'all, hope you had a good week. Um, we're going we're gonna to get into the message in, in just a moment. I just wanted to say uh, one thing real quick before we do, and that is that uh, two weeks from today, we have a really special treat coming. Um, longtime friend of the story, New York Times bestselling author, um, podcast guest of the Maybe God podcast, John Burke, is coming to be with us in person. He's the author of Imagine Heaven, which is a book that has touched many, many, many lives. Um, and uh, he'll be speaking in person on the 4th of February at all services here, the main campus. You'll be hearing him online and over at Timber Grove as well. And uh, just a really gifted man. The Imagine Heaven book, if you're not familiar with it, was detailing and sort of cataloging lots and lot, hundreds of near-death experience stories and what people saw. And uh, some of them were like Christians that experienced these things, some weren't, and it was just a real wide range of stories, but they all had some things in common. And, 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 and his second book, his follow-up book um, to, to Imagine Heaven is called Imagine the God of Heaven, and it's about specifically the experiences people had in the presence of God in, uh, in those near-death experiences. So it's going to be a really special, meaningful moment. I think life, death, and the afterlife are things we all think about sometimes. So um, it's going to hit home. So we'll uh, tap the brakes on the Acts series uh, in two weeks and just hear from John Burke. I hope all of you can make it. It'll be well worth your time. It's a great week to invite a friend uh, or two to the story so uh, they can hear John Burke as well. All right, y'all have study guides, I hope. Uh, when you came in, they gave you an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. I think y'all have them at Timber Grove. And if you're online, you can find the link to the study guide in the comments section of whatever platform you're, you're working from today. Um, today's message is part, is it 17? Or it's 18, right? I think it's 18. I wrote 17 in my notes, but I think it's 18. Part 18 of 26 in our series uh, called Acts of the Apostles, how a handful of ordinary, uh, I just messed this up every week, how a, how a handful of nobodies became a movement for everybody. It's my title. I can never get it right. So anyway, uh, it's, uh, it's been a great time. It's flown by. And today we're going to look at a passage that I think is maybe top three most mission critical <laughs> Um, texts in the book of Acts, maybe in the whole New Testament for a church like ours, because as a reminder, our mission at the story is to inspire non-religious people to follow Jesus. Non-religious is intentionally a vague term because it's meant to be a catch-all for anybody that's not in with Jesus yet, kind of folks that are spiritual but not religious, folks that uh, just sort of are, are living their lives and not really thinking about joining a church or being uh, religious in that way, but they still believe in something being out there. They have a notion. Um, and, and, and that's been our mission for nine years. Um, we'll celebrate our ninth birthday next month. And uh, since the beginning, we've tried to do that, but what we've learned, it's a hard lesson, but what we've learned is that you can't do that accidentally. You, you can't do that um, by default and, and, or drifting into it. That mission of, of reaching non-religious people with the gospel of Jesus and inspiring them to follow him, that has to be done intentionally. Why? Because it's only natural for churches and Christians to default inwardly. Y'all, we won't drift outwardly. If we drift, we will drift inwardly. And what will that look like? Well, it'll look like in another nine years, the story, programming and planning with insiders in mind. Why? Because it's easier. Because you guys are the ones that email us <laughs> with questions and, and can we do this or that or the other? And there's nothing wrong with that. But, but if we don't have the governing principle of, of inspiring non-religious people to follow Jesus, you, you know, why not just serve each other and, and be happy together? Like that's where the drift will happen. We'll end up slowly but surely preaching to the choir instead of to the world. I can, I can see how it could happen. Some of you have called us out when, when we've let it happen, rightfully so, and thank you for that. 
And so if we're going to reach and inspire non-religious people to consider and follow Jesus, it's got to be done on purpose. Why? A couple reasons. The first I've already talked about, there's a little bit of lethargy that can take hold. We can easily get um, a little lazy. Uh, and, and, and I think more than that, more than just religious laziness, I think it's just being worn down by the world around us. Like just getting kind of sick of the world. If I can speak frankly, anybody ever feel that way? Am I the only one? You get a little tired of the world and the way the world is. And it, it just feels like and seems like a world gone mad, getting madder by the moment. Headlines just get crazier and crazier. It's an upside down, constantly chaotic, combative world. Cancel culture is like, is like weaponized now in, a, in, a, in the culture wars. And, and you know, it's, it can be pretty demoralizing to be a Christian in this world. And, and I just want to name that as a reality. Because I feel it. I know I feel it. I don't know what to make of the world sometimes. I don't, know what to, I don't even know how to make sense of the world sometimes. It's crazy what's happening in the world. Like, a few examples, okay? When I was a kid growing up in the sticks, all my buddies were rednecks, and all my redneck dads, like my friend's dads, would make fun of people who don't drink or didn't drink Budweiser products. And now they'll make fun of you for drinking Budweiser products. <laughs> And, and, and everything changed when they put, like, the Dylan Mulvaney person on the can, and then Kid Rock started shooting up the Bud Light cans, and now rednecks don't drink Bud Light anymore. It's the craziest thing, this world we're living in. Everybody's, everybody's so kind of easily swayed and triggered, if you will, for lack of a better word. Um, I think about what's going on on a wider scale. Like, we've got two wars going on in the world right now, right? two major wars. We've got one in Ukraine, one in Gaza. If you have the nerve to question either war, somebody in your life will come after you for it. Just by asking questions, if you, if you question what's going on in Ukraine and our involvement in Ukraine, if you have left of center friends, they probably have the Ukraine flag in their bio of whatever social media platform they're on, and they're going to call you a fascist or something like that for questioning that war. On the other hand, if you question what's going on in Gaza and our support of it as a, as a nation and all of that, if you've got conservative friends, you'll probably have them coming after you for being anti-Semitic. It's like we're always on edge. It's exhausting, you guys. Anybody else? It's just exhausting. Thank you, Todd. I appreciate that, brother. And I'm not the only one. It's good because I feel like I'm taking crazy pills like, like the guy from that movie. You ever seen the meme? I feel like I'm cra taking crazy pills every day because everybody's just so on edge. And I am too, if I'm honest. I recently heard that United Airlines has made a decision. United Airlines CEO came out and stated that United's goal, their goal as a, as a company, is to have at least half of their pilots be women and people of color. Now, look, I love women. I love people of color. I'm as pro-diversity as anyone. I'm the only white guy I live with. Like, I, <laughs> my family is multiracial, okay? So it's like, okay. I'm pro-diversity. I love diversity. But there's something I love even more than diversity. You know what that is? Landing safely. Okay? So, and I'm not even saying that women and people of color are any worse than white dudes flying planes. I'm just saying the goal of United Airlines should be find the best pilots. All right? Just get the pilots who land. I don't care what they look like. I don't care what boxes they check or don't. Like, like I'm booked on a United flight at the end of this month. All right, an international United flight. I'll be back for the next Sunday. I'm just leaving to check in on our friends in the Dominican Republic. It's United, and I would really appreciate it if they had their priorities straight, okay? I would really appreciate it if they prioritized landing. But the world is out of whack and drives me nuts. And the older I get, the more nuts it drives me. I'm becoming the get off my lawn guy. I fully recognize it. It seems like only yesterday. That lifestyles like polyamory and swinging were marginalized at best. All of polite society frowned on such things. And now, everywhere you look, another mainstream media outlet is promoting polyamory and throuples and swinging as a healthy 
way to live your life and pursue pleasure and find love. These are mainstream outlets. This isn't like Playboy magazine like running these articles. It's the New York Times and the London Times and, and everywhere you look, Newsweek, etc. All I'm saying is the world is out of whack and everybody knows it. That's not the question. The question is, now that we know the world is out of whack, what are we going to do about it? How will we as Christians live? Are we going to become monks? Ascetic? Cut off? Set apart from the world completely? Like, forget in the world and not of it. We're just, we're just not of it, right? It's like, we're just going to do our thing and get together with other Christians. Is that really the posture we're going to take? Well, that's the question before us. And uh, today, I think what we're going to see from Acts chapter 17 is a master class in how Christians should respond to the world around us. So this is Acts 17, verse 16, is where we're going to begin our reading today. If y'all want to take a Bible or a Bible app or follow along with me on the screen. Acts 17, verse 16, one verse, and then I'm going to hit pause. So this is Paul. While the apostle Paul was waiting for his buddies, his Christian cohorts, to arrive in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city of Athens was full of idols. Pause right there real quick. Okay. It's indeed true the city of Athens was full of idols and monuments. I know this because I play Assassin's Creed Odyssey with my daughter uh, on a regular basis. Me and Joel, so our, so our, our pastime is, is Assassin's Creed Odyssey. And in that game, it teaches us there's idols all over Athens. You could also read a history book if that's your thing and know that Athens was full of idols. Okay. Um, What that tells us is something about the Athenian worldview, which was important because in the New Testament days, the Athenian worldview, the Greek worldview, ruled the the minds and hearts of the Roman Empire. Now, the Romans had conquered Greece militarily, but the Greeks had won the culture war. The Romans didn't really have much of a culture to speak of in their own right. They adopted the Greek culture, and that's why we call it the Greco-Roman world. Um, And so Athens, the, the, the capital city of Greece historically, traditionally, um, was the center of all intellectual discourse and debate. It was a center of creativity, philosophy, the arts. It was a, an amazing place, I'm sure. So all the smartest, most brilliant people would descend upon Athens and debate their ideas with each other. And, and Paul was there for it. He looked around and saw Athens for what it was. And look, um, he didn't like what he saw. He, he didn't like the idolatry that he saw. And it wasn't just about the idols. It was what, it's, what the idols said about the people of Athens' worldview. And if you could just humor me and dial in for a second, we talk about worldview, this couldn't be a more important thing to get your head around today. Worldviews are uh, something everyone has. You have a worldview, and I do. Your worldview is the lens through which you see and understand and make sense of the world around you. So the reason we can look at the world today as it is and say the world has gone mad is because of the lens we look through. The world is not as it should be based on the lens we're looking through. Some people would look at the world today and say, well, this is exactly the way it should be because they have a different lens than us. Okay? But, but if the gospel isn't your worldview as it should be for Christians, then what is it? That's the question. And, and Paul saw that the worldview of ancient Athens was polytheistic, idols, plural, and that it was pagan. And what that means is the worldview of the Athenians was as different as it could be in some ways from the worldview of the gospel. So our worldview as Christians says, hey, trust God. Trust God, lead not on your own understanding. Trust God when you're in a bind. Trust God to get you through. And then out of your trusting relationship with God, let him show you how to use your skills and what you have, your time, your life to serve and honor him. Paganism flips that. Paganism says, basically, trust yourself, trust what you have, trust what you can do, your skills and your gifts. And when you get in a bind, Go find a God who can help you. Go find a God you can use to get you through whatever you're going through. And the Greeks had gods of all kinds, gods and goddesses to choose from based on what they were going through. Now, the, the, the reason that this conversation matters, and it mattered then, is because your worldview tints everything. 
determines everything. And if your worldview is the gospel, there's all sorts of wonderful, powerful consequences to that. If your worldview really is the word of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ, that's how you see and understand everything. Do you understand what that's going to lead you to assume about people? Every single one made in the image of God, completely endowed with intrinsic worth and value, worthy of respect and, and honor, even if you disagree even if you'd like to dismiss them or cancel them or ignore them. No, they're made in the image of God. They're, they're worth knowing, loving, serving even. How do we know that? Because of who Jesus is and what he's done for us. And, and so there's a whole series of outflows from that worldview. And, and you can imagine what the outflows would be from a worldview like polytheistic paganism that is so often sort of me-centered self-worship, I'll curate my pantheon of gods around my own needs and wants and wishes. Does that sound familiar to anyone today? Like, this isn't just an ancient worldview. This is alive and well today. And that's one reason why we're talking about this passage in depth the way that we are. Most important thing to see with this first verse is that Paul's heart was broken. He didn't just feel disgust. He didn't just want to evacuate and get away from these heathens. His heart was broken, and that drew him into the culture and not away from it. And the question is simple. Is yours? Is your heart broken for people that don't know our Lord, for people that don't know the truth, people that don't understand the gospel? Does your heart break? Not just does your stomach turn. Our stomach turns, but does your heart break? And, and, and I hope that it does for us, especially given our mission as a church. Let's keep reading. Verse 17 now of chapter 17. So Paul reasoned in the synagogue. So his heart broke for what he saw. He went to the synagogue to be among his people first to talk some of this stuff through. So this is on purpose. Reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace. So then he went out to the marketplace of Athens day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. These are the two major sort of streams of thought within first century Greek philosophy. The Epicureans were pleasure first, not like, not like hedonists, the Epicureans just didn't believe in any kind of afterlife, so it was like, eat, drink, and be merry now. The best virtuous life you can live is to enjoy your life to the best of your ability, within reason, within moderation. The Stoics, on the other hand, said, no, we have responsibilities, we have duties, and the most virtuous thing we can do is to live according to those duties. But the Stoics, even though it sounds like they're closer to Christianity than the Epicureans, the Stoics didn't believe in God at all. Like, they believed not a... Let me clarify, to be fair to the Stoics. The, the Stoics didn't believe in a God outside of nature. The Stoics were pantheists. They thought that God was in everything and was everything and, 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 and that, that creation itself was, in a way, God. So they were also missing it. That's who Paul was debating with, the Epicureans and the Stoics. Again, these worldviews are still around today. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? That was an insult that... They threw at him. What's this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods, plural. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. So that's lost in translation a little bit. The foreign gods they accused Paul of preaching were Jesus and this person called resurrection. Like The Greek word was anastasis, and they thought that was like Anastasia, like a goddess that he was preaching to God. So that shows you how little they understood. But you'll notice Paul doesn't react to any of those false accusations. You'll notice. Pay attention to what Paul does and doesn't do. Then they took Paul and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. You're bringing some strange ideas to our ears and we would like to know what they mean. And here's Luke's parenthetical, which I love. Luke says, all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. So that sounds like Twitter or X or whatever. Like that's what that was. Like all day, every day, this is what we do now. Okay. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, people of Athens. Listen to what he says. This is his opening line. 
People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. And so you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. Ignorant sounds harsher in English than it was in Greek. It was just like you just don't know the one you're worshiping here. So I'm going to proclaim this to you. It's no surprise that Paul came across such a a monument. Those monuments were all over the Greco-Roman world. They have found dozens and dozens of them in the ruins of ancient Roman cities like this one. Literally a monument to an unknown god. It's no surprise also why pagan polytheists would have such monuments. Because, again, the gods were there to serve us. And we want to make sure that all the gods know they're at our disposal. That we acknowledge them, even if we don't know their names. So the Greeks had all kinds of gods whose names they knew, but they wanted to make sure they hedged their bets and covered every base. So they always had a monument to some unknown god, to the foreign gods, the faraway gods, just in case any god came along and said, I can't help you, you don't know me. Look, here's your monument. You were unknown to us. That's the sort of of game they were playing. But I want you to notice how Paul began this message, this TED Talk of sorts. This wasn't a sermon. He was in a secular environment. Paul said, he, he didn't say, uh, you, you idiots, right? He, he didn't say, you guys, have, you're, you're totally wrong about everything. He, he also didn't, interestingly, he didn't throw the, the good book at them. Like he didn't quote the Old Testament prophets, for example. Why not? Well, these are people that didn't even know or honor the Old Testament prophets, And so why would he bring a Bible and impose it on people who aren't living in a surrendered way to it? He's he's a brilliant um, rhetorician in this way. I think a lot of Christians could stand to learn a lot from this. Sometimes we quote Ezekiel to atheists, and they're like, who is that? Why should I listen to Ezekiel? And so there's a better way to go about it, really. Um. We should always quote scripture to each other, to Christians, uh, you know, in our discipleship. But, but in this context, there's a better way to go about it. So he didn't say, what are you guys doing? You're so wrong about everything. He said, I see, Athenians, that you are very religious. It's like you're searching. Wow, that's incredible. You're, you're striving. You're pursuing God or the gods or whatever. It's like a compliment that he starts with. This wasn't pejorative. It wasn't condescending. He's like, he's like, I see that you're religious. I see you trying. It's almost like, keep going. You're you're almost there. You know, he's like encouraging them in a way. And it's, it's a beautiful thing to, to behold, given what Paul really felt about their false religions, right? I see that you're very religious. It's common ground. It's acknowledging their worldview. Remember what I said earlier in this message, the, uh, the diatribe I went on? Of my my get-off-my-lawn diatribe, right? What if we revisited some of those matters and other issues like them? What if we, instead of letting our emotions and our disgust take over, what if, what if we applied Paul's principle to some of what we see going on in the world around us. And when we ask ourselves, why are people bending the knee to DEI? Why are people so woke? Maybe maybe let's take a step back and, and ask a better question. Like, maybe we should stop to consider, maybe people aren't just being woke. That's lazy, y'all. There's something better to ask here. Why do people care so much about diversity? Because God made them to. God made all the people, y'all, in all their forms, in all their cultures and colors. God is a lover of diversity. Heaven will be diverse. God might be the most diverse being to ever be. And if we're all made in his image, then this inner yearning for diversity shouldn't surprise us with our worldview because it comes from somewhere. Now, it can be way overblown and way misplaced and 
hyper-prioritized, you know, it can become the middle, th the central thing instead of just a peripheral thing, right, that we value. But still, we Christians can look at these sorts of situations and say, look, people feel this way because they have a divine spark within them. And that spark has not gone out. Even if they're pagans or whatever they are, that spark is still there. And this desire for diversity might be evidence of it. Let's start there. Why do people get into these relationships with multiple partners? Ethical non-monogamy is what they're calling it, which sounds just oxymoronic. Ethical non-monogamy, okay. But why are people pursuing love and intimacy and affection with such fervor? Because God made them to. He didn't make us to do that, <laughs> but he made us to desire affection, love, and intimacy. And so maybe we, we start a better conversation there. Why do people care so much about protecting the environment, about climate change and all of that? Are we just going to say, well, they're just, you know, tree huggers or they're just liberal hippies or whatever? Like, what are we going to say? There's something better going on there. Because even if we disagree theologically, we must acknowledge that at its core, we find this deep desire to protect creation. God told us to be good stewards. He made us to be. And so there's common ground to begin with. Instead of just jumping off the deep end into insults and backbiting and things like that. All for the purpose of having a better conversation. That was Paul's approach. He could have said a lot more than he did. But that was his approach and he stuck to it. Let's keep going in uh, verse 24 now. The God Paul says, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. Remember where he is and what's around him. All kinds of temples built by human hands. And he's not served by human hands like he needs to be served, right? That's the, that was the premise of, of paganism. The gods need us to serve them so we can get something out of them. Rather, he said, this God, who is basically saying outside of creation, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man, he made all the nations, not just one, not just Israel, not just Greece, all the nations out of one man, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out to him and find him that was God's desire. Y'all listen. But they would seek him and reach out to him and find him. Though he is not far from any one of us. You don't have to look far, he's saying. He's right here with us. For in him, this is in a quote. I'm going to explain why. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Two different poets, Paul quotes, off the cuff, by memory. Poets that he has taken the time to pay attention to and memorize. Amazing. Let's keep, let's keep reading before I run out of time. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, to turn around from that ignorance. For he has set a day that he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Amazingly, Jesus didn't even, I mean, I mean, Paul didn't even drop the name of Jesus here. Did you catch that? Why? The Greeks wouldn't know who that is yet. He's just explaining what God has done through this man. God's son, the resurrection, changed the game. And through the resurrection, God is making the truth known to the whole world. That's Paul's point here. And, and in making that point, he quotes two popular Greek secular kind of poets, pagan poets. Can you imagine what kind, of, what kind of heat a preacher today would catch for quoting secular popular poets? Like I preached a little bit about Taylor Swift one time and three people left the church. <laughs> and she's by far the, not the worst of the people I could have I didn't go like Lil Nas X on y'all or anything, you know? It's like, but Paul had no hesitation about quoting their own poets back to them. 
He introduced God and the gospel to the Greeks by speaking their own language. And this is so important, y'all, because people are talking about God and hungry for conversations about God now maybe more than ever. There might be more in-depth conversations about God happening in the world than there are in the church right now because people are curious. A few months ago, back in October, Justin Briley was with us and he shared a message from this same chapter in Acts back in October the British accent guy, you remember him? And uh, he, he talked about this very thing, like former atheists like coming full circle and saying, yeah, it makes sense that there's a creator, there's a divine being, an intelligence behind the, the universe. How else can we explain how anything is here and how we are here? Conversations are happening in the world and Christians should be ready to engage. I recently came across this stand-up act. You know, y'all know how much I love Stand-up comedy is probably a vice I need to let go of, and I couldn't even play the clip of this comedian because uh, it would probably get me fired if I played the clip. There's so much language in it. Uh, his name is Pete Holmes, and Pete Holmes is a secular comedian and, and as gritty and edgy as any comedian you can think of probably, and he recently ruffled the feathers of secular kind of agnostic and atheist people by saying this. I'm going to quote him, and I'm going to butcher the timing. I'm not a comedian, okay? So just work with me. That's the only way I could do this and censor the language. So <laughs> this is what he said in a, in a stand-up act. He said, some people think God created the universe. Some people think nothing created the universe. And the nothing people make fun of the God people. They say God doesn't exist. Okay, he says, maybe. But do you know what definitely doesn't exist? Nothing. That's the defining characteristic of nothing, he said. Nothing doesn't exist. So what are we talking about? Either you think it's God, something you can't see, touch, taste, photograph, and science can't prove, or you think it's nothing, something you can't see, touch, taste, photograph, or science can't prove. But I think we can all agree that if your nothing sometimes spontaneously erupts into everything, that's a pretty magical blanking nothing, he said. <laughs> and then ask the nothing people what happens when you die, and they'll tell you nothing. Nothing happens when you die. You go into nothing. And then he said, when they say that, I'm like, you mean you merge back with your creator? You merge into the one who made you? Dude, that sounds like heaven. <laughs> and, and he set the world on fire with this because it was such a uh, witty and insightful way of going after the question of our existence. This is the sort of conversation I hope more Christians can learn to have. Non-religious people are asking all sorts of questions about God, and most of them pertain to the origins of life and the meaning of creation and how we got here. And Paul knew that. Very little has changed in that regard since Paul walked the earth, and we should know that's still the case today. People are asking right now more than ever, what happens to a civilization or a society like ours whenever we divorce ourselves from our ontological underpinnings? Meaning, this society we enjoy, maybe the greatest society that's ever been as far as quality of life and prosperity and all that, it was founded on theological underpinnings that are Judeo-Christian in nature. There can be no denying that. What happens when you take that away, when that crumbles and dies? What happens to the society that those underpinnings have been up holding? Well, eventually, what happens is we'll start believing that everything is nothing. Everything came from nothing. We'll start treating ourselves and others like nothing because that's what we'll believe that we are. We'll treat life like it's nothing. And the divine spark that once inspired us to care for each other and to care for the climate and the environment and to care about war and things like that and, and innocent life, the, that kind of divine spark will give way eventually to the nihilistic notion that nothing really means anything. A few weeks ago, I saw a great example of this. There's a Christian rapper and artist and uh, influencer named Zuby who took to Twitter or X and pointed this out, and it's a long tweet, but I'm just going to boil it down. He said, I don't think I've ever said this publicly and directly, but I think the West is absolutely, I don't want to say that word because I'll get fired, blank, if it loses Christianity. He doesn't just mean the religion, he means the ontology, the philosophical underpinnings of Christianity. It's like removing the foundations of a building, but privately expecting it to remain standing forever, all while enemies both outside and in are trying to knock the building over. A very insightful take from Zuby. He got a lot of attention on its own, but he got even more attention when the 
the owner of X and Tesla and SpaceX and the boring company and all these other companies that he owns, uh, uh, what's the brain chip, Neuralink and all this other stuff, Elon Musk replied to this tweet and said, I think you're probably right. Elon's not exactly an evangelical, you guys. I don't know if you know that or not. <laughs> Conversations are being had. We should be prepared to engage. Christianity has a much better story to tell than everything came from nothing and nothing really means anything. Christianity has a better story to tell and we need to tell it. The story of Christianity is very simple and elegant. It is that you and every single human being you will ever come into contact with were created intentionally by God, purposely. God knit you together in your mother's womb. God has plans for your life. You're here for a reason. You and every other human being have intrinsic worth and value. You are worth loving. You are worth saving for God so loved the world, right? You were worth forgiving. As far as God is concerned, everyone is. From that position, we, we come to conclusions like we all are here with responsibility. We're all responsible for taking care of the world. This didn't come from nothing. It came from God, and so we should treat it accordingly. People didn't come from nothing and nowhere. They come from God in his image. We should treat them accordingly. This is a much better story. It's a story the world needs to hear. It's one that we need to tell. And so if you're not yet in with Jesus, I hope that this reminder from Acts 17 falls on fertile ground in your heart. And if you are in with Jesus, but you have friends and family members, close loved ones who aren't. I hope you can receive this, I hope all of us can receive this reminder today, this model from Paul on how to initiate and carry out better conversations about the most important things. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this reminder today. I pray that you would, um, if our hearts aren't already broken for the world around us, that you would fulfill your promise made through Ezekiel many, many years ago to remove our heart of stone, the cold and dead heart that many of us feel inside of us, remove that heart and to give us a heart of flesh, one that is alive and bleeding and beating for the world around us. Lord, help us to see your creation, your world, our neighbors and ourselves as you see us. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name.